continue our study on the victorious Christian life. In the first session, we were looking at the various characteristics of a Christian life as described in the New Testament. In the second session, we were talking about the victory that is possible. In this session, we are going to focus on the partnership between God and man. Man's part and God's part. Now, sometimes we think that it is God who does everything. Well, in a sense, that is right. But that doesn't mean that we have no part in it. I made a remark yesterday that though salvation is free and by grace, all done by the work of the Lord Jesus... Our growth in sanctification is not like that. You can never grow in holiness or sanctification without your deliberate yielding your will and your life. God doesn't enable us to grow spiritually or grow in holiness or in sanctification without our consent. He doesn't force us to become holy. He wants our cooperation. Now, I want to show it to you from the scripture. Will you please come with me to Colossians chapter 3 to start with. We are going to read many verses this morning, best to, just to show that we do have a part in our practical sanctification. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Mortify therefore... Your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, I'm reading from the KJV. You may have some other version. And, uh, you know, the word mortify means put to death. That is something we are exhorted to do. It doesn't say it will die a natural death. It doesn't say these things will die automatically. It doesn't say that. It says, you put to death. So whose responsibility is that? Is God putting it to death or we have to put it to death? So mortify means put to death or render powerless. So that's a responsibility on us. We have to put to death these members which are upon the earth. It's our responsibility. There are many other verses that say the same thing. Let me take you through some of them. In the first epistle of John, and chapter 3, Apostle John talks about our great hope, the great hope of the return of the Lord Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, and verse 3, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. That is last part of verse 2. For we shall see him as he is. Now look at verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If you have this hope, you should purify yourself. Now, Everyone that had this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. This is talking about not God purifying us. This says he purifies himself. So that is our responsibility. We purify ourselves. Look at chapter 5, 1 John 5 and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, 
and that wicked one toucheth him not. Whosoever is born of God keepeth himself. So if you are born of God, you have to keep yourself. Now you might ask, is it not God who keeps me? That is true. But that doesn't mean you don't have to keep yourself. Let me give a very simple example. You know, morning before you go out, and usually we all pray, Lord, we are going to office or work or study. Uh, keep us safe on the way, grant us traveling mercies, and we go. Suppose you're walking uh, to your office. Do you walk through the middle of the road because you prayed in the morning? Before crossing the road, what do you do? Oh, I have prayed today, so I don't have to look left or right. Do you have to keep yourself or not? Give me an answer. Do you keep yourself? Yes. Before you cross the road, you look left and right, and if you see an approaching vehicle, then you stop. Haven't you prayed that God might keep you? Yes. Is it necessary that you keep yourself? Yes. If you walk through the middle of the road saying, I pray today that God might keep me, I tell you, you will see the Lord today itself. <laughs> Your hope will be fulfilled. So, it is true that it is God who keeps us. You see, even if you are, sl even if you are sleeping in your bedroom in the house, a lorry can come and hit you. You know that, right? You read such things in the newspapers. Huh? A truck uh, driver lost his control and he rammed into a house or fell on a house. You can die. You know, several years ago, I read a very interesting news. Some, uh, I think it was in Spain or Switzerland or some country in Europe. Uh, some horses were walking through the road and an airplane crashed on them. And these horses died in an air crash. Can you imagine horses dying in an air crash? That can happen. So, even if you are careful, even if you don't walk through the road, it is God who keeps us. We believe that. We have no question about it. That is true. But that doesn't mean that we have no responsibility. So, God does his part in keeping us, in purifying us, in helping us. That is true. At the same time, the scripture says... We have to purify ourselves. There are many things that we need to do. God accomplishes the work of sanctification in our Christian life with our cooperation, with our consent, with our partnership. You remember that uh, incident when the Lord Jesus fed the 5,000 with two loaves and, you know, um, uh, um, with uh, loaves and fishes? You remember that? That little boy who came that morning with his lunch pack, he was used of God to feed those thousands of people. Five loaves and two fishes. See, God, the Lord could have created uh, bread and fish from nowhere. You know, he's the creator of the universe, we know that. He could have just done like that uh, and uh, created uh, a fish and bread and supplied it. But that's not what he did. He took that bread, blessed it, multiplied it. He used what that little boy had. That little boy was willing to give what he had in his hand. And the Lord used it. Imagine that little boy returning home that evening. Huh? And uh, shouting uh, and telling his mother, Mom, today me and the Lord, we've had 5,000 people. Is it right or wrong? Is it right or wrong? Yeah, he was telling the right thing, right? Who actually fed? We know it is the Lord who fed, but the Lord used him also. He also had a part in what was done. So it is very important that we do what we are supposed to do. Very often we leave everything to the Lord and we just relax. I have no responsibility in my spiritual growth. If God wants me to grow, he will make me grow. That is not a right theory. So here we read in 1 John 3.3, 3, Everyone who has this hope, let him purify himself as he is pure. So this is talking about purifying ourselves. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, here is another, another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves 
from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It says, let us cleanse ourselves. This is not talking about the Lord cleansing us. No. There is a sense in which the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanseth us from all sin. We believe that. But this is not talking about that. This is talking about uh, us cleansing ourselves. So this cleansing has to be done not by the Lord. This cleansing has to be done by ourselves. There are things that we need to cleanse ourselves from. You know that verse we read in 1 John 5, 18. Whenever I read this verse, I remember an incident that took place in Trivandrum Zoo, I think, many, many years ago. You know, in 1 John 5, 18, we, we read, uh, He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. When does the wicked one do not touch you? He does not touch you when you keep yourself. So what happened in Trivandrum Zoo, I think this is many years ago, they did not have a modern zoo as you have now. now. Now it's like an open zoo. But in those days, it was just cages. And one man went and stood very close to have a close watch um, on the bear. There was a bear in, in a cage. He went too close to that bear that the bear put its uh, hand through the uh, iron grill bar and plucked this man's nose. See, he went too close to the bear. If he had kept himself away, you know, he could have been saved. But he did not keep himself. That is true of the devil also. If you get too close to the devil, he will pluck your nose away. There are places where you are not supposed to go. If you go there and stand there, you are too close to the devil... And he can do anything to you. So there are things that we need to take care of ourselves. So this verse says, He who is born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. So if you do not want the wicked one, if you do not want the wicked one to touch you, don't go to such places where he can touch you. Keep a distance. Keep away. If you stand there praying, suppose you stand close to the bear's cage and you're praying. Will that help you? That is not going to help you. You know, common sense would tell you, it is not standing there and praying. It is just keeping away from the cage that will save you. There are many things that we need to do. See, for example, suppose you're watching a program on, on TV. And something evil, something bad, dirty is coming up. You know that. That's what's going to come up. And the remote control is in your hand. Don't pray that God might send Gabriel to put, on your, to put off your TV. Okay? So who should put off the remote control? God should put it off or you should put it off? Don't wait for Gabriel or Michael to come and switch off your TV. It is the control is in your hand. That is what we are talking about. I hope it makes sense to you. There's no sense in praying, Oh God, please switch off my TV. I don't want to see this. Something dirty is coming up. I don't want to see this. Please switch it off. God says, you switch it off. The remote is not in my hand. It's in your hand. And it is your responsibility to switch it off. That is what we are talking about. So, the wicked one does not touch us. When we do not go near him. So this verse we read in 2 Corinthians 7, one, It says, let us cleanse ourselves. Okay, another verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We, we see a similar usage there. And verse 21. 2 Timothy 2.21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So what is he supposed to do? If a man therefore cleanse himself from these things. So who should cleanse? It is not God cleansing. That is not what we read here. 
he should cleanse himself. So you see our responsibility. And uh, you know, I think it is Saint Augustine who said this, without God, I cannot. Without me, God will not. I think that's a very meaningful statement. Without God, I cannot. We know that without God, we can't do anything. But without me, God will not. Without my cooperation, God will not do. What I can do, God will not do. Did you get that? What I can do, God will not do. What God should do, I cannot do. What I can do, God will not do. What God should do, I cannot do. Think of the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus is standing at the tomb of Lazarus. And we know he is going to raise that dead man, stinking man, not just dead. He is stinking for four days. And what did the Lord Jesus say first? Let the stone be removed. Is that what the Lord said? What do you read in John 11? Did the Lord stand there and say, let the stone be moved? Did the Lord say that? No. Then what did the Lord say? You move the stone. So I want to ask the Lord, Lord, can't you move the stone? You're going to raise the dead man. Can't you move the stone? Why should we move the stone? If you ever say that, the Lord will say, well, moving the stone is something you can do, that you do. Raising the dead is something that you cannot do, that I will do. Did you get that? God will never do what we can do. Moving the stone, anyone can do. But raising the dead, no man can do. That he will do. You think of a farmer. Okay? A farmer in the field. He is supposed to get up in the morning, eh, water the ground, till the ground, put manure, and uh, pluck out all the tares, and take care of his garden. That is what he is supposed to do. That is his part. And what is God's part? Send sunshine. That the farmer cannot do. Send rain at the right time. Huh? And arrange the right weather or climate. That is something God, that God should do. So, there is something that the farmer has to do. There is something that God has to do. What the farmer can do, God will not do. Suppose the farmer says, Lord, it's too cold this morning. I didn't have a good sleep last night. I want to sleep a little more. Could you please send your angels to till my land? You think God will send? Have you ever seen angels tilling any ground, anywhere, in any field? No. That is something the farmer has to do. He has to get up early in the morning. But then, giving sunlight and rain, that is something the farmer cannot do. That God himself has to do. So, you see, in every sphere of life, there is a partnership between man and God. Even when we say it is God who does everything, you know, God wants us to cooperate in what he does. That is true in our spiritual life also. In 1 Peter 5, there is a verse which says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time. So who should humble himself? I am waiting for God to make me humble. Is that what it says? No. You humble yourself. It will it'll be too much if God humiliates you. Don't wait for that, Okay. You better humble yourself before God starts making you humble. So the Bible says, you humble yourself. Don't wait for God to make you humble. So all these verses speak of our responsibility in cleansing ourselves, in purifying ourselves, in keeping ourselves. Without our cooperation, God will never accomplish the work of sanctification in our life. This is a great truth that we have to understand. Now, very often we are very careless in our Christian life. We don't do what we are supposed to do. And then we wonder why we are not progressing in holiness. See, we, wrong, we go to the wrong places. Then we want God to protect us. We watch the wrong thing on internet or on the phone or on TV 
and we want God to keep us clean. That will not happen. It is up to you to make sure that you never touch some of those stuff. That is your responsibility. It is not enough to pray. Prayer is important, no doubt. Lord, keep me pure, keep me close to you. That's good. But that is not enough. You need to exercise control on your own life. I go to a country <coughs> where I have to do some ministry every year. And I know that in that country, very bad things come on TV. I know that. So in my room where I stay, they have kept a TV for the you know, teachers to watch uh, news or whatever. But because I know that there is danger in that country, more than any other country that I know of, I have made a decision that I will never switch that TV on in my room because I'm all alone in my room for about two weeks and no one comes to, very seldom does anyone come to visit me there. So I'm all alone except when I'm preaching. I'm all alone in the room. And the TV is right there and my bed is there. And I can see whatever I want to see. But I know that it is dangerous. So I have made a decision for myself that I will never even once switch on the TV in my room. See, if I, go to, if I come to your house, I may switch on your TV and watch news or wildlife or whatever. But in my room when I am alone, this is a decision that I have made, a covenant that I have made with myself, that I will never switch on that TV. Now, I am not saying this to pray, praise myself. I am saying this, this will help me next time I go there. Oh, uh, I said this in CBF camp, so I better be careful. All right. So that's going to help me. So by God's grace, all these years that has helped me. I have not switched on that TV even once in my room. See, it is not enough to pray, Lord, keep me safe, keep me pure. I don't want to see anything evil. At the same time, if I keep switching on the TV, my prayer is not going to be answered. So it is in my own interest. It is my responsibility to see that I do not do those things. You remember in Job 31 and verse 1, Job said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. How can I look at a virgin? That means, how can I lustfully look at a woman? That's the meaning. So Job says, Job doesn't say, God has made a covenant with mine eye. Okay? God doesn't make any covenant with your eyes. You have to make a covenant with your eyes. It is between you and your eye. Let me ask all of you. Have you made a covenant with your eye? That I will never watch anything unhealthy on my phone or my internet or, or on my computer or on my TV or in a magazine or newspaper or, or anywhere. Have you made a covenant with your eye? This is your part. This is our part. I'm not talking about God keeping us. God will always do that. He is faithful. But do you keep yourself? How do we keep ourselves? By refusing to be entertained by anything that we know to be evil. That's a deliberate covenant that you have to make with your eyes. I will never use my eyes to see Anything that is unhealthy. Have you made a covenant with your eyes? That is your part. That's what we are talking about this morning. Our part. God's part is clear. We don't have to even talk about it. God will do what he is supposed to do. But what about our part? This is something very, very important. One of the reasons why many of us fail in our Christian life is... We fail to do what we are supposed to do. And we just think that God will do everything. My friend, God will not do everything. God will not do what you are supposed to do. Switching on your TV, switching off your TV, God will not do that. Working on your field as a farmer, God will not do that for you. But God will do what he is supposed to do. In the Sermon on the Mount, you know, yesterday we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel, there is something that the Lord Jesus said about this. 
uh, what we are supposed to do. In Matthew chapter 5, look at verses 29 and 30. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Who should pluck it out? God should pluck it out or I should pluck it out? Huh? If my right eye offend thee, or offend me, I should pray, Lord, please put out my right eye. Is that what that verse says? That is not what it says. You pluck it out. Okay. And cast it from thee. For it, profit, it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that they, the, thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. So what's the meaning of this? Have you thought about this? What does it mean to pluck out your eye and cut off your hand? Does the Lord want us to do this literally? Huh? If I pluck out my right eye, I can lust with my left eye, right? So then what's the point in plucking out my right eye? If I cut off my right hand, I can sin with my left hand. You know an amazing thing? Once I listened to the testimony of a blind man. He was blind, even now he is blind. But he is saved. You know the amazing thing about that testimony? The sins that he has committed. I tell you, most of you with both eyes have never done those things. The sins that he has committed, uh, the evil ways through which he has traveled, he doesn't have both eyes. I was really surprised to hear his testimony. How many evil, filthy things he has done as a blind man. So it is not going to help you in your struggle with sin if you put off your right hand or you know, cut off your right hand or pluck out your right eye. So this is not something physical. Even if you take out one eye, you can still sin with the other eye. I think this is talking about a radical attitude that we should have towards sin. If it is my right eye that leads me to sin, or my right hand that leads me to sin, that causes me to sin, I must be willing to cut it off. That means declare war against anything that leads you to sin. I think that is what the Lord Jesus meant. You take a radical strong attitude against anything that leads you to sin. If it is my hand that leads me to sin, it doesn't say go for a physiotherapy, right? It says just cut it off. If it is your eye that leads you to sin, it doesn't say go to a computer testing lab, uh, see and uh, go to a place and get a new specs. That is not what the Lord said. He said just pluck it out. What does that mean? Our desire for holiness should be so great. We should be so earnest in that. We should be willing even to get rid of our eye or cut off our hand. We should be so earnest in the pursuit of holiness that we would rather lose our eyes than commit sin with our eyes. We should be so earnest in our pursuit for holiness that we would rather lose our hand than commit sin with our hand. I think that is what the Lord meant. Declare war against anything that leads you to sin. What's the practical application of this? If my friendship with this person is causing me to sin, cut it off. That's what it means. If my going to that house will make me sin or make me fall into sin, I stop going to that house. If my watching this program on serial is creating evil thoughts in my mind, I stop watching that program. That is what it means. So, cut off and pluck out. That is something that we have to do again. It is not something that God does, but the Lord said, you do it. You cut off your hand. You pluck out your eye. In the book of Daniel, in the very first chapter, when Daniel and his friends went, to, went into Babylon, they were given food that they were not supposed to eat, eat as Jews. They had food regulations, as you know. And there's a beautiful verse in chapter 1 about Daniel. You know, he purposed in his heart. That means he was determined that he will not 
defile himself with the food that was given to him. Let us ask a question to ourselves. Are we determined? Have you purposed in your heart that you will not do anything or watch anything or go to any place where your mind is likely to be polluted? Are you determined? Are you purposed in your heart? Have you made a covenant with yourself? As did Job. That is how Job could keep himself from sin. That is how Daniel could keep himself from pollution. So remember, we have a responsibility. It is true that God will do his part, but remember, there are things that we are supposed to do. There are places where we are not supposed to go. There are things that we are not supposed to watch. There are friendships that we are not supposed to make. There are places where we are not supposed to visit. There are situations where we are not to be, not to be found. Whose responsibility is that? It is not God's responsibility. It is our responsibility. I can pray for grace, of course, Lord. I really don't want to do those evil things. Please help me. Give me grace. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. I can pray and I'm sure the Lord will give it. But there are certain things that we are supposed to do. I think it is good to pause here for a minute and ask this question. Am I doing my part? Am I doing what I am supposed to do? Am I fulfilling my role or am I just leaving everything to God for him to do everything? I tell you, in practical sanctification, it doesn't work that way. God seeks your cooperation and my cooperation. So, I showed you verses, and probably there are many more, where it says, you humble yourself, you put to death, you cleanse yourself, you purge yourself, you keep yourself. These are all exhortations that we have to follow. And with our cooperation, God wants to make us holier in our day-to-day -day practical life. I would like you to come back to that first passage that we refer to in Colossians 3. You see, there, in verse 2, it says, Set your affection on things above. See, set your mind. That is something that we have to do. We have to set our mind on things above. And in, look at verse 8, Colossians 3, 8. But now ye also... Put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, and all the other things. You put off. That is something you are supposed to do. And then verse 10, and you put on the new man. You see, all these things are things that we are to do. You set your mind on things above. You put to death certain things. You put off certain things. You put on certain things. These are things that we are supposed to do. And when we do those things, we will be able to progress in our practical sanctification. Our Christian life will become better and better. I think there is a question that we need to ask ourselves. What are the things that I can do from my side for the progress of my Christian life? What are the practical steps I can do? You see, if I can make a list of it, that will be very good. What are the practical steps I can take to grow in holiness? What are the things that I am supposed to do? And many of you may have a long list. Maybe number one, I must stop watching this particular program. Number two, I must stop visiting this particular site. Number three, I must cut my friendship with so-and-so. Number four, I must stop watching. Uh, 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 I must saw, uh, stop looking at these posters on the road. You know, I have a friend of mine. He once told me, I can't even read the newspapers because of some advertisements, you know, or some news that he sees in the newspaper that causeth him to sin. He, he, uh, he confessed it to me. He said, I find it difficult to look at the newspapers. 
So he was so earnest in his desire to be holy that if it meant not reading some news, he would rather not read them than be polluted by them. See, knowledge of sin will not make you holy. You know, some people do research into sins. Huh? What kind of sin is this? They, want to, they, they say, we don't want to do it, but I just want to know. My friend, knowledge of sin is not going to make you holier. That will only pollute your mind. So, there are practical steps that we need to take. You know, pornography is a, is a big thing these days, you know that. And you say, oh, all these college students, these young people are addicts to it. If you say that, that is because you don't know what's happening in the world. Do you know that among believers, there are people who are addicted to this? Not just college students. Even married people. There are men who are addicted to this. I know some people like that. Believers. Why? Is it because God is not keeping them? Is it because God is not helping them? That's not the reason. They are not keeping themselves. They have made no covenant with their eyes. They are not careful. They are not doing their part. It is not God's mistake. If there is anyone here this morning, I hope there is none. But if there is anyone here this morning be tem being tempted in these areas, this morning, God is telling, asking you to do something about it. You can ask for God's help, God's grace. You can ask help from your elders or seniors and counselors. That's fine. But there is a step that you need to take. You know, once a man uh, told a preacher, Sir, please pray for me. And the preacher asked him, what should I pray for you? What's your prayer request? He said, please pray that I might be able to get up early in the morning. So the preacher said, all right, I'll pray for you, but one condition. When your alarm rings, you must promise to me that you will put one leg down from the court. Then I will pray for you. You know the meaning of that? Huh? It is not enough to pray. Well, I am not against if you are praying, that's fine. But when the alarm rings, it is your responsibility to get up. Lo and behold, I get up. That is what you should say. Even though I feel like sleeping a little more, I must do what I am supposed to do. Not just what I feel like doing. You know, very often the problem is, we do what we feel like doing. That will not help you. You should do what you, are, you know you should do. What you know you are supposed to do. Not just what you feel like doing. Suppose you have to go, to go for an interview tomorrow morning. Start from your home at 5 o'clock to get to that place. Huh? And tomorrow morning it's very cold. Do you feel like getting up? You don't feel like getting up. But you know that you must start at 5 to get there on time. So you don't feel like doing it. But still you do it. That is how we should act. You may not feel like doing certain things. Oh, I don't feel like praying today. I don't have the mood to pray. Huh? That is a reality huh? for some of us. So what do you do? If you don't have the mood to pray, what do you do? Go to God and tell him that you don't have the mood to do. That's what you are supposed to do. You go to God and say, God, today I, don't, I feel bored. I really don't feel like praying. But where else shall I go? There's no one else to go to. So, Lord, I'm coming to you. Though I don't feel like, you know, praying, I'm still coming to you. Please help me. That is what you should do. Don't depend on your feelings. Don't follow your feelings. Don't just do what you feel like doing. Do what you know you should do. There are things that we are supposed to do. Don't follow your feelings. So this preacher said, if you put one leg down, then I will pray for you. You know, that was just to remind him that he has a part in disciplining himself to get up and sit in God's presence. If we are not willing to exercise our part, our role, then don't expect God to help you. Now, some of you are students. You pray that God might help you to study. That's fine. 
but you should sit up late into the night or you should get up early in the morning and study right can god do that for you the studying no god can do that for you you can ask for god's help for wisdom for memory and all that but you should make up your mind to set your alarm or ask your dad or mom to call you early in the morning and when they call you you must get up wash your face you must sit and study that is something that you are supposed to do god cannot do that for you that is so in our christian life i feel very many of us fail in our christian life because we fail to do our part we fail in our responsibility we just pray and we leave the rest to god we don't do what we are supposed to do now this is not self effort you know when i preached this in one place someone came and said oh you mean to say in our own effort we have to do no that's not what i'm saying in our own effort we can do nothing god is the one who should help us but there is a role that each one of us has to play i hope this is very very clear to you this morning so then what are we supposed to do we have to take practical steps we have to take practical steps now the rest of the time i would like to give you some practical tips some practical things that we can do in the light of these truths okay number 1 daily prayerful dependence on god realizing the weakness of our flesh that's a practical thing that you can do daily prayerful dependence on god realizing the weakness of our flesh you remember in in romans chapter 7 apostle paul said in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing that's what paul said so please remember that in yourself there is absolutely nothing good in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing remember that realize that tell that to yourself all the time so every morning as you start the day realizing the weakness of your flesh you depend upon god and say oh god i want you to hold my hand today i want you to help me i don't want to fall i need your grace today depend on the lord on a daily basis suppose you know that you are going to have uh a problematic situation in your office today you're going to talk about some disputes in some some context or you're going to be provoked in some way you know that you're going to have a conversation with someone and you're likely to be provoked you're likely to get angry you're likely to lose your temper you know that in advance what shall we do take anticipatory bail you understand that take anticipatory bail what is that early in the morning you go to god and say god this morning i have to talk about it i have to meet that person and i am likely to fall i need your grace i cannot trust myself so i trust you to control me lord help me so realizing the weakness of your flesh a prayly a daily prayerful dependence on god i tell you that will help you i've seen this in my own life wherever i go almost every day i pray this prayer lord i want you to help me today because i don't know if you don't help me i may fall i want you to help me is it something that uh, that's difficult for us to pray asking the lord's help that is not something difficult all of us can do that even the weakest person can do that so that should encourage you that is number 1 number 2 these are just practical tips in the light of these truths number 2 a second thing that you can do is never feed your old nature feed only the new you understand the old nature and the new nature though we are saved we still have the capacity to sin because we are living in the sinful flesh be determined that you will not do anything that encourages your old nature your sinful nature certain things that you watch can encourage your old nature certain places you go can encourage your old nature don't feed your old nature in any way evil conversation watching evil things evil companionship all those things can encourage boost huh your old nature don't do any such thing rather feed your new nature how do you do that 
by reading the word of God, by meditating upon the word of God, by spending time with God's people, by having fellowship with God's people, by talking about spiritual things, by going to the meetings, by listening to tapes or, you know, uh, watching videos that are spiritually helpful. So, always feed only the new nature. You know, that's a practical decision that we can take. I will never do anything that would encourage my old nature. Rather, I would do things that would encourage my new nature. So, keep encouraging, keep feeding your new nature and you will become stronger and stronger in your spiritual life. And then when temptations come, you will know how to handle them because you are strong spiritually. You can say no to them. But if you are not strong spiritually, when temptations come, you cannot say no to them. So that's another practical thing that you can do. A third thing, declare war against anything that leads you to sin. I've already explained that from Matthew 5, so I don't want to spend much time on that. Do you remember that? Declare war against anything that leads you to sin. If it is your hand that leads you to sin, cut it off. If it is the relationship that leads you to sin, cut off the relationship. If your reading that magazine leads you to sin, stop reading it. If you're watching something on, on, on the screen that leads you to sin, stop watching it. Declare war against anything that leads you to sin. You know what leads you to sin. Maybe your friendship, maybe your association, maybe your conversation, maybe the presence of somebody leads you to sin. And declare war against anything that leads you to sin. Number four, reckon yourselves dead unto sin. You know, these, we are talking about our part. These are things that we are supposed to do. Reckon yourself dead unto sin. Look at this verse in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. Romans 6, 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon means consider. That's the meaning. So consider yourselves to be dead unto sin. What does that mean? Considering yourself dead unto sin. You know, a dead man is a man who doesn't respond. If there is a dead man here, dead body here, you call him, you know, any bad name or use any bad name to address him, he just will not respond. If he responds, I'm sure you'll run away. Right? So, here is a dead body, and you call him anything. He wouldn't respond. You show him a 2,000 rupees notes. Will he smile? If he smiles again, you'll run away, I tell you. Okay. So, he will not smile. See, a dead man is a man who doesn't respond. Whatever you show him, whatever attractions, allurements, enticements you present before him, he doesn't respond. So, when it comes to sin... We should reckon ourselves, consider ourselves as dead. How do you do that? Eh? When the enticements, attractions of sin comes, you consider that I am a person dead to sins and alive unto God. You know, in First Peter chapter 2, verse 24, we read this. Christ went to the cross so that we may be dead unto sins and alive unto righteousness. So you should consider yourself dead unto sin. So when sin's temptations come, eh, when they call you, when they invite you, you should say, no, as far as sin is concerned, I am a dead person. No response. Imagine, a, 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 a think of a man who has very severe diabetes, you know, sugar problem. His sugar is very high. And he goes to the doctor and the doctor says, don't touch sweets. The moment you touch it, you will die because your sugar is so high. But this fellow, poor fellow, he loves sweets. Jalebi and ladu, that is his breakfast. But what to do now? The doctor says you'll die if you, if you touch it. He wants to live in any case. But there is a mitai dukan, a sweet shop uh, near his house. And he has to pass that way every day as he walks down to his office. 
Now he is in trouble. What to do now? But he remembers what the doctor said. You will die if you touch one of them. But he says, oh, I don't want to die. I would rather not eat those things than die. So he makes up his mind. Okay? Next morning, he knows that he will be tempted as he passes through that way. But next morning, he walks that way. And as he crosses the sweet shop, all the ladus and jalebis and all that, they, they say, good morning, please come in. You know, he feels the pull. He feels the pull because for many years, that was his breakfast. He feels the pull. But then he remembers what the doctor said. And as he walks past that shop, he says, As far as sweets are concerned, I am dead. And there, left, right, he goes. That's how he gets the victory. As far as sweets are concerned, I am dead. No response to you anymore. See, that is what we should do with sin. We, are all, we all feel the pull of sin every day in our life, in various contexts, various situations. We are pulled. And when you feel that pull, you must say, as far as sin is concerned, I am dead. As I mentioned yesterday, when you feel like gossiping, eh, when that pull comes, you say, as far as sin is concerned, I am dead. Or anything else. That is how you get victory. So these are all practical things that we have to do. Consider yourself dead unto sin. Another practical thing that you can do is, <clears throat> do not compromise or reason with sin, but flee for your life. Do not compromise or reason with sin. You know, the basis for saying that is Genesis 49. You know what Joseph did? Huh? Joseph was attracted or Joseph was uh, uh, you know, Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph to sin with her. And, you know, there are some very interesting, very uh, uh, important things written there about uh, 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 Joseph. And uh, I have, I really appreciate those things. I would just like to show you some of those things. Uh, come to Genesis 39. Sorry, not... Uh, not 49, it is 39, okay? Genesis 39. And in Genesis 39, you see the uncompromising stand of Joseph. Uncompromising stand. You know, in verse uh, uh, 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said... Unto his master's wife, behold, my master, uh, all that. And uh, uh, last part of verse 9. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Look at the next verse. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. See, it was not a one-time temptation. Have you noticed that? Verse 10 says... Day by day. It is one thing to say no one day, but it's a totally different thing to keep on saying no every day. In Joseph's case, it is not just one day. She tempted him day by day. And Joseph refused not only to lie with her, but to be with her. In the Malayalam Bible it says, to sit with her. Imagine this lady saying, all right, don't do anything. Just sit by my side. What's wrong in sitting by my side? Joseph said, not only that I will not sin with you, I will not even sit with you. No compromise. That's what I was trying to say. Do not compromise with sin. Don't reason with sin. Don't say, what's wrong in, I'm not going to do anything bad. What's wrong in sitting there? There's nothing wrong. I'll give her a little bit of counseling. Family counseling. Be faithful to your husband. Okay, don't do such things. Joseph said, none of all that. No compromise. Not only that I will not lie with you, I will not even sit by your side. Uncompromising attitude. Then what did he do? Finally, when she compelled him, verse 12, he left his garment in her hand and fled and got himself out. He fled. That's what I said. Do not compromise or reason with sin. 
That means don't give any place to sin. Counteract and flee. So do not compromise with sin or reason with sin. Counteract and flee. That is what he did. He did not compromise. He did not even sit with her. He didn't wait to give her a piece of counseling. He counteracted and he fled for his life. We read here that he's left his coat. Joseph, it is true, he lost his coat, but he kept his character. If you lose your coat, you can stitch another one. You go to a tailoring shop, you can stitch another coat. Not difficult. But if you lose your character, I tell you, it's not easy to stitch it back again. Dear brothers and sisters, even if you lose your coat, please don't lose your character. If you lose it, you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to be able to stitch it back again. So don't compromise. At the very outset, say no. That is what you should do. Huh? Don't reason with sin. That is, oh, what is wrong in doing this? Where is it written in the Bible that we shouldn't do it? Even David did it. Don't say all that. Okay? That is reasoning with sin. Don't reason with sin. If you reason with sin, you will surely fail. If you reason with sin, you will surely fail. You know, one of our brothers, a senior evangelist, he told something very interesting once. He was in North India, he was traveling in a train. And as he was traveling in a train, uh, a massage wala, you know, massage wala, one who uh, pours oil on your head and in your body and he does all the massage, you know. So that's a massage wala. He came in the train with a bottle of oil in his hand. Anybody wants malish? He's asking. Huh? And uh, some people said no, and then he would leave them. Uh, some others, would, uh, they would like to have it. They said, okay, then he'll pour some oil on their head and, and do all that. So he came to this, uh, our evangelist. So there was a man sitting near him to whom this man asked, do you want this? He couldn't make up his mind. Okay, uh, should I have it or not? You know, that kind of a thing. You know, this massage well is a psychologist. He knows his business well. When he understood that this man is not saying a firm no, uh, he was in half mind, he opened his bottle and poured the oil on his head. Abhi paisa dene se chutega. Okay, you got it? He didn't say yes, but he didn't say no also. So this man understood he is in half mind. Probably I can get him. So when he was sort of doubting, he opened the bottle and poured oil and started doing. Then this man enjoyed it. You understand that? When sin's temptations come, straight away say no. If you reason with it, if you argue with it, if you try to do a little bit of compromise, it will have its impact on your life. I'll just say one more before I close. One more practical tip. Remember that the pain of sin will soon erase the pleasure of sin. Remember that the pain of sin will soon, or the plague of sin, will soon erase the pleasure of sin. You see, sin in prospect is very interesting. In prospect means when sin is before you. But in retrospect, it is very painful. When you are about to do something evil, you know, you have all sorts of promises before you. Oh, if you do this, you will feel good. You will get pleasure. You will get a kick. You will feel high. All sorts of excitement before you do it. But having done that, when you look back, in retrospect, it is very painful. In prospect, sin is interesting or attractive. But in retrospect, it is painful. The pleasure of sin is momentary. It is for a season. You know, in Hebrews 11, we read about Moses. The transient, eh, he chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For a season means for a short while. Since pleasure is only temporary, but the pain that it can bring, depending on the nature of that sin, 
the pain can be long lasting for the pleasure of 5 minutes you can suffer for 50 years do you know that if you compromise 5 minutes you can suffer 50 years sin is so dangerous it is like playing with fire if you play with fire you will definitely get burned sin would bring consequences even when sins are confessed and forgiven depending on the gravity of sins committed it can still bring consequences do you know that david he sinned and he asked god to forgive him and god forgave him but he had to suffer the consequences of those sins for many more years in his life remember sin's pleasures are temporary but the pain that it can bring can last long so may god help us i just wanted to give you some practical tips huh, as to how to keep yourself pure so in this session we were mainly talking about our side man's side god is faithful in fulfilling what he is supposed to do he will never fail but God asks us to cleanse ourselves, to keep ourselves, to humble ourselves, to purge ourselves. That is our responsibility. Make a covenant with your eyes. And as did Daniel, Daniel, be determined in your heart. Oh God, by your grace, I am going to live well. I make a covenant with my eyes. I will control my thoughts. I will control my looks. And I will keep myself so that Satan may never be able to touch me. And in the light of these biblical truths, we, we, we were talking about some practical things that we need to do. Daily prayerful dependence on God, not feeding the old nature, but feeding the new nature and, and all the rest. May God help us that we may be faithful to God in maintaining purity in our own life. God will make us, God will never make us holier in our practical life without our consent. He will never work against your own will. Remember that. May God help us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this yet another opportunity to think of these great truths from thy word. We know that these truths have great practical implications in our day-to-day -day life. This world full of sin, full of temptations. And we, as we live in this sinful flesh, we need a lot of your grace. And we now pray that thou will give us grace to do our part, fulfill our responsibilities, so that we may be able to grow in holiness in our day-to-day -day life and experience victory in our Christian life. Lord, we pray that none of us may be slack in doing our part. And we know that you will never fail in what you have to do. But we need your grace to do what we are supposed to do. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and pray that these thoughts may linger in our minds and continue to help us all the days of our life, that we may be careful in our Christian walk. We ask this prayer in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen.